number of people already um, joining us. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. I wanna start off with an intro of Dr. Divya Patel. Um, Dr. Patel is joining us from Florida. She is at University of Florida Health in Gainesville. Um, and we are so glad to have her here today. She is an active member of the sarcoidosis community as both a clinician and a researcher um, and is very involved in the sarcoidosis space and is a key leader in that space. Um, additionally, she is obviously a practicing pulmonary specialist um, who has been working on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we are um, you know, hearing from one of the leading experts right now on this um, for our specific community, and we are so fortunate to have her here. So thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Hey, you're welcome. I'm really glad to be here. This is like a nice break from what I've been doing for the last couple of months. So, and I love interacting with the sarcoidosis patients and especially um, with FSR. So I'm really happy to be here. Awesome, well, thanks so much. Um, so with that, um, we will get into it. And again, um, you know, for any late joiners, this will be recorded. So if um, you, know, you have to step away or there's anything you miss, you will get a recording of this link. So um, do not be worried. Um, all right, and with that, we will jump right into our Q&A. Um, so thank you everyone who submitted questions when they registered. We got a great deal of questions. Um, and as we anticipated, of course, many of them are very similar, um, which is good. It means that we know, you know what our community is interested in hearing about today. And we are going to be prioritizing the questions that were specific to COVID-19. Um, there were a decent number of other questions that were kind of general disease questions or more specific medical questions. Um, but we are going to be prioritizing COVID-19 related questions today since that is the topic of our webinar. However, I do encourage you, if you have further questions um, after the event, to reach out to our staff, look into our other educational resources. Um, if you um, are familiar with our educational programs, you know that we recently held um, a patient education summit that actually two summits this fall that Dr. Patel participated in as well. Um, so those are lasting resources for our community as well. Um, but jumping right into the questions here, um, like I said, there were a good deal that um, followed kind of similar, similar themes. So I have broken these down um, into those kind of overarching themes for everyone. So the first um, kind of topic, if you will, is going to be focused on more general COVID and sarcoidosis related questions. Um, and so with that, we will launch right in. Um, so the first question, um, obviously, that's on everyone's minds is, are sarcoidosis patients more at risk of catching uh, COVID-19 and having more severe symptoms and presentations of that disease? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's a question that kind of immediately came to mind once the COVID pandemic started to worsen in March. And that's still a question that we don't have a clear answer to. Um, but I think we have some like pretty educated guesses. So one thing I'll say is in terms of risk for catching COVID, um, I think there's probably, um, I, I think that if you have sarcoidosis and you're on immune suppressing medications, there's a possibility that you're at higher risk of quote unquote catching it. Um, but catching the virus and having the symptoms and having the syndrome and the disease also depends on a lot of things. You might be exposed to a person who has COVID, but the severity of your symptoms, how, um, uh, and, and, and whether you actually get it or not is also dependent on other factors, not just your own factors, like being on medications or, or, and having sarcoidosis. So for example, if you're exposed to someone who has really severe COVID and they're really coughing and there's a lot of virus particles in the air that you're inhaling, there's a higher chance that you're going to have, you're going to get COVID and that 
uh, it could be more severe in your situation than other people's. Um, I anticipated this question and I did, yes, last night, go through the medical literature and, and make sure that I didn't miss any articles specific to this question. There was one article that Dr. Morgenthau at Mount Sinai published a few months ago in the journal Lung. And um, Maggie, if you want, I could even share my screen because I pulled up the article because I knew I would get this question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, if I can, sh I'll share my screen just to give you guys a little bit of information. Um, this is a, I mean, this is from a, a large medical center in New York City from during the time where the pandemic was just very severe. And um, I know that a lot of you guys like to read and, and read the articles on, on the internet. So this is the article that I found that was published uh, in August this year in this journal Lung. And Dr. Morgenthau works at Mount Sinai Health System, which is a large health system in New York City. They experienced a huge number of patients in their health system during the uh, peak of the pandemic in New York City in the spring. And what they did is they took all the patients between March 1 and July 29th that were admitted to their hospital system, which was a total of over 7,000 patients. And they noted that only 37 of, per, of them, which is about half a percentage point, had sarcoidosis. And what they said is that overall, the rate of developing, um, having a more severe COVID and having issues ending up in the ICU was slightly higher in patients who had very severe impairment in their lung function. So if you have pulmonary sarcoidosis and you have very severely impaired lung function. Um, so those are the values you get on your breathing tests that you do when you go to your doctor's office. They had um, a higher rate of having, uh, you know, being in the ICU or having a more severe case of COVID-19. But overall, I would take this study with a grain of salt because the number of people in this study with sarcoidosis was very small. So, so this was a very small study. I, this information is there. I'm not surprised by the results that people with worse sarcoidosis of the lungs had worse outcomes. Um, so that's not incredibly surprising. I don't put a lot of weight on this study just because there was such a small number of patients. What I will say is that there is an ongoing international registry going on that was started by Dr. Karen Patterson, who's in England now. And um, this is an international study in which we've been including all of our patients from all over the world uh, with sarcoidosis. And eventually, once we have some follow-up data, that, that information that has been collected from different centers, including ours and, and centers all over the US, Canada, and, and uh, Europe, Japan, um, and Asia, they'll combine all of that information so that we have a bigger number of patients so we have more confidence in the results that we get. Um, how much confidence you can you have in a study is partly dependent on how many patients are in the study. So the bigger the study, the better. Um, one other thing I want to plug is that FSR does have a survey, a COVID survey, about how COVID-19 has been affecting people with sarcoidosis. And some preliminary data that Dr. Boffman and Dr. Judson suggested that actually the severity of COVID was no different in people with um, sarcoidosis compared to people who didn't have sarcoidosis and that being on immunosuppression may not really impact the severity of disease. So at this point overall, it's unknown, but I don't think it's as severe as we all predicted. Excellent response and thank you um, for the, the very thorough background, including um, sharing your screen there. And I do want to let all of our uh, participants know that um, more information on those surveys that we've discussed can be found on our website. Um, and I will also work with Dr. Patel to link to that specific um, study that she was showing as well. So if anyone wants to access that, they can. Yeah, Maggie, would you be able to put it in the chat box by any chance? I would, yes. Yeah. Maybe that way people can have a copy of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes. Um, all right. So 
As kind of a follow up to that question, um, and Dr. Patel, this doesn't have to be an in depth answer because the answer may very well be we, we don't know yet. Um, mm -hmm. But we did have quite a few questions about people who either have extra pulmonary sarcoidosis, they have absolutely no lung involvement, mm -hmm. um, as well as patients who have cardiac involvement who are asking if they're at any specific risk and if that may vary from the results of the study. Um, sure. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I, I, you'll, you're going to hear me say this a lot this afternoon. Um, yeah, we don't know the exact answer to this, but just thinking about the way COVID works and what I've learned um, in the months that I've been, I've been spending taking care of the patients and also taking care of my own sarcoidosis patients who have developed COVID, I think that the chance that you're going to have severe respiratory problems if you have um, sarcoidosis outside of the lungs is probably lower because just because your lungs are healthy. Um, I think something that could potentially affect that is if you're on a lot of immunosuppression, like if you're on a lot of medications that are suppressing your immune system, that potentially could um, make it more likely that you get COVID. But again, so far the survey that um, FSR has been doing with Dr. Boffman and Dr. Judson really hasn't shown that. Um, but there is a possibility that, you know, the immunosuppression could make you more prone to, start, to COVID. It just probably is not going to affect your lungs as, ba as badly as someone who has very severe uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis. Thank you. Um, additionally, um, several questions were asked of can COVID-19 actually cause sarcoidosis? Um, there have been stories in the news of people having long-term damage to their lungs could this worsen my disease? So what I will say is I don't think as far as we know that COVID can cause someone who didn't have sarcoidosis to develop sarcoidosis. So I think the answer to that is no, as far as we know up to this point. Um, although I will mention that, you know, in the past there have been studies that show that certain bacterial infections can potentially increase your risk of sarcoidosis. We've never shown that in a virus though. So I think the chance of COVID causing you to develop sarcoidosis is, is unlikely. What I will say and what I have seen is that people who have um, lungs that are damaged from either sarcoidosis or let's say COPD or really severe emphysema who get COVID, it is possible that some of them develop, a small percentage of them develop fibrosis or scarring in the lungs. I have seen that. And um, it is possible that if you have sarcoidosis in the lungs and then you get very severe COVID that you could develop more fibrosis or scarring in the lungs on top of that. Yeah, that is possible. I haven't had a patient develop that. All of my sarcoidosis patients who have gotten COVID have recovered very well. Um, they're back to where they used to be. You know, COVID wasn't pleasant for them, but, you know, they did pretty well. I have seen patients with normal lungs who had no other lung conditions get COVID and then end up with scarring in their lungs. Thank you. Um, this question is very interesting. Um, someone asked, because SARS-CoV-2 is an immune modulator, is there anything that we've learned from COVID research that could help us more fully understand sarcoidosis? Yeah, I, I saw that question, uh, Maggie, you sent me yesterday. That is a really interesting question. Um, we don't know yet, I think is what I'll say. There are people working on this. Um, in fact, some people in my institution are working on models for sarcoidosis, but also using the same, um, same device, same materials that that they're using to model sarcoidosis to also model COVID-19. Um, you know, COVID-19 uses the immune system and, and um, causes the immune system to be activated just like, and that's exactly the scenario in which sarcoidosis um, uh, develops. So there's a possibility, but right now we don't have any evidence for that. Thank you. Um, and this one, a big one, um, should I still be wearing a mask? I read online they can harbor bacteria that can actually make my sarcoidosis worse. Yeah, I'm so glad that we're talking about this. Um, wearing a mask is 
very, very important. It is the best way to prevent um, yourself from getting COVID. Uh, and the reason we know that is because there's been numerous studies that from at this point that show that that the virus that causes COVID-19, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that virus travels in respiratory droplets. Um, so you're much more likely to get COVID-19 by breathing it in if someone near you has COVID and coughs or sneezes um, than by touching a surface, for example. So I think the evidence on that is very clear. Mass are, I tell my patients masks are mandatory. Um, I will tell you guys the advice that I give um, to my patients about protecting themselves from COVID. Number one is masks. Anytime you are outside of your house and outside of around the people that you're normally around on a daily basis. And I also say um, that things that are, you know, when you go out, places that it's okay to go out to is number one, it's okay to go outside and walk around in your neighborhood, get some fresh air, get some exercise. It's okay to go to the grocery store or drugstore to get your medications and, and food. And, and that's kind of where I leave that. And then the third piece of advice that I give to my patients is please don't have, you know, visitors that are outside of your, you know, immediate household in your home because, you know, um, your family may be very careful and your visitor may be very careful, but if they're asymptomatic and carrying COVID and not wearing a mask when they're with you in the house, that could um, uh, lead to an infection um, in my patient. So I, I recommend against that. I cannot, I cannot uh, emphasize enough how important masks are. I actually got married a few weeks ago and everyone at my wedding wore a mask. Um, even the priest wore a mask. So masks are incredibly important. Um, and the question about uh, the masks harboring bacteria, um, I would not be, I am not concerned about that. And, I, and you should not be concerned about that either. It's more important to wear a mask than worry about bacteria on the masks. So the advice that I can give you about that is if you have masks like this, like the disposable kind, the medical kind of masks, switch them out every day. So I would probably not reuse this after 24 hours. So like I get rid of mine at the end of the day when I get home. If you wear the cloth ones, I wear those too. Those are excellent masks. Um, I What I say is that um, wash those in, you know, in, 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 in a tub of hot water and some detergent, laundry detergent, at least once a week, and they'll be clean. The reason you don't need to worry about bacteria on masks is because, you know, our lungs are always exposed to bacteria in the air, bacteria and viruses and fungus in the air, because every time we take a breath in, we're inhaling organisms. So there is a chance that there could be bacteria on your mask, but the chance you're going to get a pneumonia or an infection from that is unlikely. So please, please, please wear masks. Uh, masks are the, wearing masks are the single most important thing you can do to protect yourself and your family. Thank you. And actually, uh, your comments are leading in excellently to, um, we have quite a few questions about holiday gatherings um, yeah. and, and what to do there. Um, so the, the main ones are, you know, is it okay for extended family to come over for short visits as long as they and I are both masked? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I didn't, I hope I didn't imply that I had a huge wedding a couple of weeks ago. I had a wedding with just my immediate family members. With so congratulations, by the way. Thank, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, this is a really hard thing um, about the holiday time because I know everyone is so desperate to be with their family. I am too. Um, but what I would recommend, what the CDC is recommending and the WHO recommends is that you, as much as possible, try to limit your holiday gatherings to only your immediate family members and your household, which means the people that live with you. 
if you feel like mentally or emotionally, you really need to see your family members, um, I think that's okay uh, um, if it's a very small group. And the caveats that I would give to that is I would make sure that everyone that's attending has had a COVID test and has been quarantining themselves for at least, you know, I would say nine to 10 days before the gathering. And quarantining means that they've stayed in their house, they haven't been to the grocery store, they haven't been to work, you know, those sort of things. They've been staying at home, staying put, they've gotten the COVID test. And the other thing is, you know, if you live in a temperate climate area in the US um, or, or, or outside of the US, if you can do it outdoors with the masks on, that you would reduce your risk even further by then, by that point. I have had some patients that just say, you know, Dr. Patel, I absolutely need to see some of my extended family. And I say, that's okay, but please have everyone get tested before they come. Please ask them to quarantine before they come and try to do it outside with masks on if you can. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question related to family, although this one's not specific to the holidays, um, and it, I apologize, it doesn't say specifically if this is a household member or an extended family member, but the question is, if a family member has tested positive for COVID, what is the length of time that I should wait before being around them? Should I wait for a negative test first? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's a question my own family faced this past summer, because some of my family members, um, uh, you know, developed COVID um, related to school and things like that. So what I would say is, um, you should court, you should, you know, that family member should quarantine and not be visiting other family members for at least two weeks. I would say two weeks. I don't think you need after that two weeks that your family member needs to get an, another COVID test. If they do a PCR test, which is the most common kind of test, it'll likely still be positive, but that doesn't mean that you need to avoid them. I think if, if, if um, you separate yourself from that family member for 14 days after that, I think it's safe to be around them. Excellent, thank you. Um, we also have a question of, um, if I work at home, how do I pr protect myself if members of my household are leaving the house to work? Yeah, that's a really tough question. Um, I think there's, you know, this is a situation that a lot of people face. They may be doing everything they can, staying home, working from home and protecting themselves. You know, I think having um, a conversation with your family members that are working um, to make sure that when they are at work, they're wearing masks, um, physically distancing themselves from um, their coworkers as much as possible um, and uh, taking precautions. And then if there's any evidence of an exposure or any hint that they could have been exposed or have symptoms to make sure they quarantine themselves away from you, it's, it's, it's tough, but... Um, I, I have, I've had some of my patients um, who are healthcare workers actually work um, with me at, at the university hospital here who have opted to um, like stay in one part of the house away from the family members that are at risk. Um, if that's possible, that potentially can help. Um, but I know that's not possible for everybody. Um, I've also had patients um, whose family members um, work in high risk settings who are staying in hotels. And again, that's not possible for everybody, but um, if there is a possibility to physically distance yourself, at least in the home, that potentially could help also. Yes, and I do wanna highlight to our community, um, one of the findings of the survey that uh, Dr. Patel referenced being done by Dr. Boffman and his colleagues um, did find that actually um, exposures from inside the home of a, another family member was the leading um, yeah. source. Um, so, you know, having those tough conversations and being very diligent with your, your hygiene procedures, even inside the house can make a huge difference. Yeah, it's very important to have your family members understand that you know um, that you're at risk, that if you get COVID-19, it's at risk. And sometimes 
it most in most of the time family members are very understanding there are tough situations where they're not and in that case you know wear your mask inside the house also keep your hands washed things like that Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we are going to move into the vaccine related questions because I know that is on top of everyone's minds and a big reason of why we're here. Um, and it did make up the majority of the questions we received. Yeah. Um, so with that, we will jump right in um, with <laughs> so many to start. Um, the first being, should sarcoidosis patients get the vaccine? Is there any risk? Yeah, so that is a really, important question. It's a question that I've been asking myself, and it's a question that I've been looking to the CDC for guidance. So what the first important thing I want um, all of the listeners to understand is that there's different types of vaccines. Right now, there's four, there's two major types of vaccines that are being developed. So Pfizer and Moderna, which are the two companies that are closest to having their vaccine be approved, and in fact, in a, um, the FDA expert panel is meeting today to advise the FDA commissioner whether they should approve the va Pfizer vaccine um, or not. So we should probably hear tomorrow or at the latest by Monday whether that vaccine is approved or not in the, here in the United States. Um, so that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moder Moderna vaccine, which are the two vaccines that are closest to being approved, are what are called mRNA vaccines. These are a new type of vaccine that have never been used before, but they have been tested in a large multi-center randomized study. And large multi-center randomized studies are the gold standard for studies to make sure that a drug or a vaccine is safe and effective. So, so far, uh, although we don't have the data, the um, us physicians and other scientists, we haven't been provided with the data. The FDA does have the data and they're analyzing it very thoroughly in detail. So far, what we've heard from the FDA is that the Pfizer drug or the Pfizer vaccine, which is very close to being approved, is safe. That's what we've heard. The good thing about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are they're not live vaccines. There are some viral vaccines, like for example, the meningitis vaccine, that are live vaccines. Those um, in patients who are have, have severe underlying conditions or take immune suppressing medications like prednisone and methotrexate and, and some of those types of drugs and fliximab, um, in live vaccines can potentially be um, can can potentially be risky for patients who are immunocompromised. Fortunately, none of the vaccines that are in development right now for COVID-19 are live vaccines. Um, so the chance of you taking the vaccine and getting COVID-19 is impossible. It's not, it's biologically impossible because it's not a live virus. You have to have an entire live virus be injected into you in order to be at risk for that. So what I'm advising, what my, I'm planning to do, and what, my, what I'm advising my family and all of my patients is that take the first vaccine that you have the chance to take. And that's what I would advise my, uh, all of the listeners. Um, I will say one, I will have, I have a couple of caveats to that. In England, the Pfizer vaccine has been uh, they started distributing it, I think, on Monday or Tuesday. It might have been Tuesday. And um, the, um, the FDA equivalent um, organization in England has advised that people with severe food um, or other types of allergies or reactions um, avoid the vaccine right now. The reason I give the caveat is, you know, these... Um, trials, the vaccine trials have been going on for a few months. They haven't been going on for years and years. And although the vaccine trials are large, um, you know, did they, did they, you know, did the trials um, detect every side effect that every person who will ever get these vaccine um, develop? No. What I would anticipate from what I've been hearing from some of my colleagues who have 
participated in these trials and from the early information we're getting from England is that there is some there's fever and pain and some discomfort associated with the um, vaccine, which is, you know, probably a little bit more severe than what you experience with the flu vaccine. But despite all of that, I'm still going to be advising all of my patients, even the ones that are on infliximab and prednisone and methotrexate, to take the first vaccine that's offered to them and not to wait. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I've told my family. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know that's um, the the articles that you're talking about coming out of England um, were also heavily represented in our questions um, with lots mm -hmm. of patients expressing concerns at that latest news. Um, so thank you for addressing that head yeah. on. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is concern. I, I, I'm kind of worried that that news is going to discourage people from taking the vaccine. The people that I would tell to wait are the people who have such severe allergies that they carry like those EpiPens around with them because if they get a whiff of peanut or if they get a really bad bee sting that, you know, they can't breathe and they need to be in the hospital right away. So if you look at the, if you look at the details of what, um, the organization, the FDA equivalent organization in England, the, the, um, the advice that they put out, what they were saying is if you have, if you're prone to getting what's called anaphylaxis and what anaphylaxis means is, you know, your lips swell up, you, your tongue swells up, you can't breathe, you need to go to the emergency room. If your allergies are that severe, then you may want to hold off. But I, they don't mean like regular seasonal allergies. Um, they're not talking about like, you know, when I get around a cat, I start itching and sneezing. So I don't think they mean that. Um, but there are people like, for example, strawberries and dairy, like if they get that, they're in really serious trouble. So those are the people they're advising. I'm hoping that the FDA and the CDC will give us some advice on that as well once the vaccine is approved. Excellent, thank you. Um, so there's also been a lot of questions regarding um, kind of the hierarchy of immunization. Um, and a lot of people have asked questions relating to should sarcoidosis patients be kind of in that first group? Yeah. Um, you know when you should be, um, you know, signing up to be one of those first um, members of the community who's vaccinated. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, this has been really confusing. Um, and the reason it's partly be, it's confusing is the federal government has um, left the order in which people will be vaccinated. Um, they've left it to each individual state to decide that. And there are going to be, each individual state's going to have a committee or the health department is going to be deciding that, that order. So far, what the CDC has advised is that the, in the first group should be patients in nursing homes and healthcare workers. There's a strong chance that most of the states will follow those CDC guidelines. It's interesting in England, they are vaccinating people by age. So the first woman, I think it was on TV, she was 90 years old, the one that, that was the first woman to be vaccinated. I think that's an interesting way to do it. What I think is going to be is most states will do healthcare workers and nursing home patients, and then the second group will be the high risk patients, including immunocompromised patients. I think that if you're a sarcoidosis patient who's taking treatment like prednisone or methotrexate or infliximab, it's my personal opinion that those patients should be included in that immunocompromised group. Um, because your immune systems are, are you know, um, depre depressed by or suppressed by the medications we're giving you. So that's what I would say. Um, unfortunately, we've had, at least in my state, so in the state of Florida, we've had very little communication from the health department. We don't know who's going to be included and how the distribution is going to be handled. One really important thing about this Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, which are the two, the first two vaccines that will come out, they require the vaccine to be um, cooled and kept in a refrigerator that goes to mi minus 80 
degrees, which is not really available. It's usually only available in research centers and big, big hospitals. So I think that it's going to, I don't think it's, you'll be easily able to just go down to your family, you know, doctor's office and, and get the vaccine. My guess is that health departments and um, large hospitals potentially might be distributing them um, more so than like your local primary care doctor. Um, but again, it's a complete guess because um, at least in my state, we've had very little direction. I'm hoping that for the audience that your states have been communicating with you guys and, and giving you guys some, some better guidance about that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of what I know and what I've heard about the way the distribution process will be. Um, if there's any like New York Times sub subscribers out there, there is a little um, uh, uh, article with a little kind of calculator that gives you an approximate idea of where you might be in line. Um, and for most immunocompromised people and for people above the age of 65, basically what that calculator shows is that they should be behind the second group of people after healthcare workers and the nursing home patients. Thank you. And we did have one follow-up question that I did want to address. Um, and please, everyone know that I um, we are receiving all your questions in the Q&A box. We simply have nearly 500 questions to sort through. Um, and so we are doing our best to make sure that those are all asked today. Um, but one follow-up question that caught my eye there was um, medication allergies. Um, if someone has a prednisone allergy or another allergy, would that be considered reason to avoid the vaccine for now? That's a really good question. I don't think we know that. I don't, I can't say I know the answer for sure, but based on what I've read, and again, this is just my best educated guess from the information that I've gotten, unless your allergy is so severe that you're having anaphylaxis, what I discussed before, where your whole face swells up, you're not able to breathe because your tongue is swollen, your lips are swollen, and you need that EpiPen or you need to go to the emergency room, I think it should be okay. Now, one thing I will say, the one good thing about having the healthcare workers go before the immunocompromised patients is that if there are issues, um, there's about 23 million healthcare workers in the United States. So, and that will take a few weeks, at least a few weeks, if not a month to vaccinate them. So if there are severe reactions, if there are huge issues, by the time that most of the patients that are, or most of the people that are on this, um, on this uh, uh, Q&A, by the time most of them will get to the point that they're needing a vaccine, if there are like severe acute reactions, we will know by then. And that may not be a bad reason to be in the second group of patients getting the vaccine. Yeah, as we all know, um, this is an ever-changing landscape as we've seen since March. Um, you know, yeah. recommendations have changed um, and we're learning more information every day, so. Yeah, I mean, what I would say and what I've heard epidemiologists at my institution and the epidemiologists that I've been reading from other institutions, what overall they've been suggesting is that the risk of the vaccine overall is lower than the risk of COVID-19 itself. So that's why they're really um, advising that people get the vaccine. Um, so the vaccine trials, did they include only healthy participants or did they include any immunocompromised patients as well? So that's a really good question. Um, I, this, uh, the, the, the straightforward answer is I don't know. Um, I can probably find that information out for you guys by looking on the, CD, uh, the clinicaltrials.gov website. That should make it clear. M my guess is that they've included pr probably mainly normal, healthy adults. Um, so I doubt that they included immunocompromised patients, um, but I don't know the answer to that for, sh for sure. But I will look that up and get back to you guys because I want to be 
a big proponent of the vaccine, especially for my patients and especially for everybody in the audience. From everything that I've read and from everything that I'm hearing, I've I've talked to epidemiologists because I've had questions about my own patients that are on, for example, infliximab and methotrexate and azathioprine. You know, is it safe for them? From what I'm hearing from them is that because it's not a live virus vaccine, it should be safe for immunocompromised patients. Thank you. Um, and we have some questions relating to um, the two parts of the vaccine for COVID. Could you give a brief overview on that as well as some questions on, will you be 100% immune to COVID after the second dose? Sure. So, so far, the two vaccines that are closest to being approved, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, they require two doses to reach that 90 and 95% efficacy rate that has been quoted in, in, in the media. Um, so, um, and the, I think that the time between the two vaccines is about between the initial and the booster is 28 days. Um, and again, this is new to us because it's a new kind of vaccine that's never been used before, the mRNA type of vaccine. Um, and what I anticipate, this is what I think that most likely will happen. I think that with the vaccine, the efficacy rate is way higher than what we typically hear about, for example, for the influenza vaccine that we get every year. The efficacy rate usually for that vaccine has been ranging the past five years anywhere between 23% to 40%. But we still get the flu vaccine every year because we know that people who get the flu vaccine, even if they get COVID, the chance of them um, having a very severe case of the flu and ending up in the hospital is much lower than for people who don't get vaccinated. With uh, efficacy rate as high as 95%, I think that at 90%, I think there's still a chance you can get COVID. But if you do get COVID, I anticipate that your symptoms and the severity of your disease will nowhere be um, as bad as someone who isn't vaccinated. Um, having a 90 to 95% efficacy for a viral vaccine is tremendous. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I, I am gonna start sprinkling some non-vaccine questions as well, um, just to make sure that we get through a good number of these. Um, if someone has sarcoidosis and they've had COVID, um, if they, are they at risk of getting COVID again? Um, and will it be more severe? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, we don't know specifically for sarcoidosis. I can speak to um, the general population and, and what we know in general about uh, recurrence of COVID-19. So very few people have had, once they've had COVID, have they had it come back or they've um, developed COVID-19 symptoms or, or gotten the infection again. But it's not, it's not, but I will say it's not impossible to get it again. So, but the chance of that is very, very rare. I mean, I've so far for what I've been reading, I've heard about handful of cases, not many more than that. So the chance of once you've had COVID, the chance of you getting it again is pretty low. Um, specifically to sarcoidosis, I've not had any of my sarcoidosis patients because I can only speak to my patients at this point because we're in a data-free zone. Um, none of my patients who've had uh, COVID-19 have had gotten it again. Um, the data about the antibodies that you develop to COVID after having it is mixed. There's been some studies that show that you might have antibodies up to eight months after getting COVID. And other smaller studies have suggested a lower um, have ha suggested a lower time frame. Although I will say that the study that showed that there was a longer time frame that you keep the antibodies was a better study, uh, um, a bigger study. Interesting. Thank you. Um, can you speak to any genetic risk factors for COVID um, and how that may overlap with any genetic risk factors for sarcoidosis? Yeah, um, the truth is we don't know of genetic risk factors for COVID. We do know of what we call phenotypic risk factors, which means, you know, 
types of patients, different types of patients. Um, probably what I've experienced in my practice the most is that obesity and its association with severity of, of COVID. And it's been shown in multiple studies that obesity is associated with um, more severe COVID. Um, we've also seen that people with diabetes um, and other comor like comorbidities, um, car cardiovascular comorbidities have um, a higher risk of developing more severe, um, severe uh, COVID-19. Um, the risk factor that's been most associated with severity is age by far. And, and, one, and one last thing I'll point out is um, gender. So men tend to have more severe um, sarcoidosis, uh, I'm not, not sarcoidosis, men tend to have more severe COVID-19 than women. So age, gender, your weight, and you know, underlying diabetes and cardiovascular conditions. Thank you. Um, you've addressed this a bit, but there were many, many questions about immunosuppressant treatments. Um, everything from, you know, if I'm doing okay without the medication or on a very small dose, such as five milligrams of prednisone, would I be better off? They, I appreciate the person who submitted this saying with physician approval. Um, yes, yes. Medication because that was about to yeah. be my biggest caveat, um, and I'm sure yours as well. Yes, um, this is such an important and good question to talk about in this forum. So early on, once, you know, we realized the pandemic was, you know, in the US and it was spreading fast, and rapidly, um, there were sarcoidosis um, leaders like Dr. Judson and Dr. Swice at the University of Illinois. Um, they actually, I think it was in April or May, they published an opinion article in the journal Chest and Maggie, I don't know if you have access to that, like if there's a way you could link that and, and send it out. If not, I can help you with that after the Q&A. Um, they published an expert opinion piece in which they recommended minimizing immunosuppression for sarcoidosis patients as much as possible. And for people who you were thinking about initiating um, immunosuppression to hold off. So that's what I've been doing in my practice. I have minimize, I've been um, decreasing doses of methotrexate and prednisone as much as I can. And I've also been um, holding off on starting immunosuppression for people who can wait. Not everyone can wait. So I want to say that if you have severe sarcoidosis that's affecting your heart, your lungs, your brain, and it's affecting your function, that, you know, you, you shouldn't wait take the treatment. Definitely, again, discuss with your sarcoidosis specialist. In my situation, I've been decreasing it. Uh, that being said, um, you know, I go back to that FSR survey. Um, you know, they noted that there was no difference in severity and, and outcomes in the patients, at least in the survey. Anecdotally, in my own practice, I've had patients on immunosuppression that have gotten COVID and done fine and have had no issues. And I never got around to decreasing their dose. But um, what I would say is it's okay to stay on immunosuppression, but talk to your doctor if, you're, if you've been stable for a long time, if your symptoms are not severe about decreasing the dose. That's what I've done for my patients. Thank you. Um, another big question was around plaquenil use, um, including, um, which is hydroxychloroquine, um, which I believe everyone will recognize from the news, um, if not from their own sarcoidosis treatment options. Um, but does any long-term use of plaquenil have any impact um, on someone's risk of getting COVID or having severe symptoms? Yeah, so this is a really good question. And unfortunately, there's no clear answer, but I will tell you about what I've read so far and, and what we do know. Um, so yeah, so initially when the pandemic first began, there was a lot of um, hype about Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine as potentially either being protective or decreasing the severity once you got COVID-19. So far, there's been no studies to date that 
no good studies to date, good quality science to date that shows that that is the case. Um, I actually just before the uh, Q and A, I read a uh, article um, in the CDC MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is a very important um, publication that the CDC has. There was a report. I can't. It was an international. A uh, group of scientists, they reported about a patient who had been on hydroxy a sarcoidosis patient on hydroxychloroquine for a long period of time, who developed, you know, COVID nineteen despite the fact that they were on it. So at this point, there's no data to suggest that hydroxychloroquine is going to either prevent you from getting COVID nineteen or be especially helpful if you get COVID nineteen. And um, you know what kind of um, upset me a little bit in the early on in the pandemic is my patients who really needed Plaquenil for their sarcoidosis. A lot of them were so desperate because they weren't able to get it because there were people hoarding hydroxychloroquine and, and sadly even doctors hoarding it. I, I hate to say it like um, I read about physicians hoarding it for their families and stuff, but so far there's no data that shows that that helps. Thank you. Um, there were several questions about um, people who do have already have lung damage from their sarcoidosis um, and what impact that may have and when they should particularly be concerned um, and involvement of lung capacity numbers in monitoring that. Yeah, so um, yes, that's an important question. Um, so, you know, there's no, what I would say is that the, that if you, if your pulmonary doctor or your sarcoidosis specialist thinks that you have moderate to severe pulmonary sarcoidosis based on your breathing tests, um, I think those are the patients, and at least what Dr. Morgenthau's paper suggested, those are the patients who are at risk for more severe and more adverse or poor outcomes with, with COVID-19 and sarcoidosis. So, if you have, if your doctor tells you that you have fairly normal numbers, which is the majority of sarcoidosis patients, if you have fairly normal breathing test numbers, then I don't think you're at high risk. Um, there's no cutoff. There's no number cutoff that says, well, one person has severe pulmonary sarcoidosis and the next person doesn't. But I would say that, you know, if you're if your if your force vital capacity or FEC, which is how much air you can blow out. Um, total. If, if you're like in the 50% range and lower, then, then maybe you are in that moderate to severe category. Thank you. Um, we also had several questions um, similar to the earlier research-related question, um, wondering, are any of the treatments that are being looked at for repairing lung damage in COVID-19 patients going to be applicable to sarcoidosis patients in the future? Yeah, I mean, wow, what an amazing question. <laughs> <laughs> sarcoidosis patients are so smart about their disease. <laughs> they know what they're talking about. So, so far, there's been three drugs that have been approved by the FDA as treatments for, or at least I'll say two drugs have been approved for, by the FDA for treatment of, of um, COVID-19. And then the third drug is dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid, similar to what many of you guys take, um, prednisone, which was uh, has the best data overall out of all the trials. So, so far, there's been three studies that sh with three drugs that show evidence that, they're, that they could be helpful in patients with COVID-19. One is, a, is dexamethasone, which, as I said, is a... Um, a, a corticosteroid, just like prednisone. And that was a study um, from the UK called the recovery trial. And they gave patients with COVID-19, severe COVID-19, um, eight milligrams of dexamethasone for 10 days. And just to give you guys an idea, that's that would be equivalent to about 160 milligrams of prednisone. Um, so it's a pretty big dose of steroids. And that is a study that has the best data for um, helping people who have severe COVID-19 and are like in the ICU, for instance. The second drug is called remdesivir. 
which is an immune modulating medication. Um, and the data and the studies for that are less impressive than dexamethasone. And primarily in our practice, we've been using it, um, giving it to people who are in the hospital and have COVID-19, but not are, are not in the ICU. And the third one is the newest one, which is a Eli Lilly um, drug, which is a um, antibody cocktail type of medication. And that we haven't used at all because the data, frankly, for that, in my opinion, is my opinion, I don't think it's strong enough to warrant um, use. Um, I think there are some patients in our hospital getting it, but not many. Um, so those are the three drugs that I think have the best data. Um, steroids we already use to treat sarcoidosis. Remdesivir, um, I think that there's a potential that it could help patients with sarcoidosis. I don't think that sarcoidosis is on the radar for that drug company at this point, but I think that you know once things settle down, yeah, I think that could be potentially a one treatment um, potentially a treatment for sarcoidosis, remdesivir. Excellent, thank you. I know that was um, a very, very popular question. Um, the yes does reflect our, our community and how- um, Yeah, they're, they're just so on top of it. <laughs> yes, um, and with that, we only have time for one more question. And there was one more specific question um, about sarcoidosis and COVID that I do wanna get to because it was pretty common um, and that's, if your sarcoidosis is not considered active. Um, there were questions on both how that will impact um, your experience with COVID-19 and if it can bring your disease back as well as um, how that affects your ability to be in the earlier groups for the vaccine. Yeah, no, those are all good questions. So I'll take it one at a time. So if you're, if you're been told that your sarcoidosis is in remission, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. I wish I could say that to all of my patients. Um, so if you're, if it's not active or if it's in remission, I think most likely, and again, this is my best educated guess because we frankly don't have a lot of information. My best educated guess is that if your disease is not active or is in remission, I think that your risk for COVID-19 in terms of severity is probably the same as any other normal healthy person. And that's my best guess. Um, it'll probably take us a few years to know the answer to that for sure. And hopefully like that large international registry that sarcoidosis researchers have been working on, hopefully that registry will be one of the things that helps answer questions like that. Um, the second question was about... Uh, a timeline for vaccination. Should oh yeah, the timeline for vaccination. So here's, here's the thing. Technically, you wouldn't be considered to qualify in the immunocompromised um, category because you're not on immune suppressing medications if you're not having active disease, most likely. Um, that being said, you know, what individual states will decide who qualifies for that on their each individually on their own set of criteria. If it was up to me, <laughs> if, if let's say the state of Florida um, says, Dr. Patel, you can decide who qualifies, I will put all of my sarcoidosis <laughs> patients in that immunocompromised group and have them you know, be in line early to get the vaccine. Um, primarily because I'm selfish and I want all of, all of the sarcoidosis patients to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, so, so if your state, if let's say your state that you're living in lets your individual physician decide who qualifies, talk to your doctor and, and see what they think and, and whether you know you can get in line for it earlier and not have to wait um, with the general population. And, and remember what I said, if also not just immunocompromised, if you're above the age of 65 um, or even, let's say you have diabetes, so it's not just your sarcoidosis that could get you qualified to be earlier in line. And like I said, if you're lucky enough that in your state, your doctor gets to decide who fits into that category, talk to your doctor. Excellent, thank yeah. you so much. And yeah, all right, no problem. Well, 
That is, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, so I first want to thank Dr. Patel so much for joining us today. Um, as you all know, these are tough questions as, as we are navigating this all together. Um, so we appreciate her giving us her, her best opinion here and um, we really appreciate all of her time. Um, I will be sending out when we um, share the link for the recording, we'll also include um, some links to the registry that she mentioned as well as that article, which is um, currently in the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, again, um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, please stay tuned as we will continue to provide updates um, as more information comes to light specifically about the vaccine as well as the disease in general. Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. And thank you again to Dr. Patel. Thanks, uh, Maggie. One more thing I want to tell you is that excellent question about where immunocompromised patients included in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. I'm going to get you that information. So you can include that with the link, because I think that's a really important question. I agree. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Take care.